Community Church family, and welcome to another Wednesday in the Word at home, as we are tonight going to be finishing up our study in the book of Jonah, and what a blessing this study has really been, and as last week I said that that is probably one of my favorite chapters in this story, and really even in the Old Testament, because it really just speaks to the character of God, and how even though Jonah you know, was may have been frustrated with God not destroying the people. When sinners repent, what an awesome thing it is that we have a God that loves us, is merciful, and is gracious, that he extends that forgiveness and allows people to become followers of his once again. So tonight we're going to be in Jonah chapter 4 as we finish out this study. Jonah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, but this displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, oh Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents. From doing harm. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. How strange of an occurrence this is that uh, many, many preachers, many ministers end up leaving the ministry. They end up stopping going to church, or they end up stop teaching a Sunday school class, or they end up stopping doing some aspect of ministry because there is very little or no response to it. Standing at the front of a church during an altar call when no one comes forward can make you feel a little awkward after quite a few times of doing it. But here Jonah has an entire city of people where even the king of that city has now declared a, a fast and a time of saying, we're going to take three days and just repent. We're not going to eat. We are going to tell God how sorry we are for all the things that we have done. And not even because we think that, okay, we're going to do this and then God is going to relent. And we're going to be saved. And there's not going to be any problems anymore. But no, this was genuine repentance because he said, even if God still punishes us, guess what? We deserve it. But we're so wrong that we are going to repent right now. And instead of being excited and exhilarated and having that put wind in his sails, Jonah becomes displeased exceedingly and becomes angry that God does not destroy them. Many commentators writing about the, the use of the Hebrew language here describing Jonah's anger, they all say it is very, very extreme. When it says this displeased Jonah exceedingly, really even our English language cannot go far enough in expressing the, the frustration, the anger, the seething bitterness that was down inside of Jonah's heart that is now being seen in all of its awful glory. We can't quickly jump over this fact that God or Jonah is so displeased with God because they repented, so God is not going to destroy them. What an awful, awful attitude to have. You believe that those people are apart from God that they are going to be separated from God forevermore if their life ends at this moment, and yet you are upset now that they are not going to be separated from God forever, but that they have repented, and now my little prophecy of the fact that they should die and that, yes, God is going to bring down his righteous fist of judgment onto them. What a disgusting attitude to be angry that people have turned back to God. 
And you see, this is why it doesn't surprise me that there are, I believe, many, many, many Christians who talk about church growth, who claim that they want church growth, who will say things like, yeah, pastor, we want the church to grow, and oh, yeah, we want new people to come, as long as those new people look and do exactly like what we look and do, or how we look and what we do. Outside of that, no, those sinners, no, those people with all of their, their, their sinfulness, The church is not the place for those sinners. Only the kind of sinners that I'm okay with should be allowed into this church. Those sinners that, that have different hobbies than I do or have different likes than I do or different preferences than I do, those sinners aren't welcome in this sinner's place. Too many people get displeased when God changes, quote-unquote, their church by allowing other sinners in, too. And lest we not forget, we are all simply sinners saved by grace. We are all under the blood of Jesus Christ as believers in what he did on the, the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection. None of us None of us are deserving or more deserving of his love than any other. So how dare we get in between God and what he is pushing us to do as his people, as his church, to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel these people to come to Jesus Christ. God didn't bring the Ninevites down to where Jonah was. God sent Jonah to the Ninevites. And you see what happened when Jonah finally went, although begrudgingly? The people repented. The people were restored back to God. Salvation came to that city. And yet this upset Jonah. This upset the man of God. The prophet of God. You know what? I'm okay with upsetting some Christians who are sitting on their own self-righteousness if it means I'm going to reach more people with the gospel. Totally okay with it. Because you can sit there and be displeased exceedingly and become angry and pray and cry out to God and say, Oh, Lord, this is, this is why I said when I was still in my country. That's why I fled previously to Tarshish. Jonah's trying to like do it. I told you so to God. God, I told you this is why I didn't want to go. Because I know who you are. I know how you are. I know the character of who you are. And even though Jonah says this in like almost a frustrated, angry, bitter way, this is one of the greatest proof texts in the Old Testament that the God of the Old Testament is different than the Allah of the Quran. So many people have tried to make that comparison and say, look, the Allah of the Quran is just like the God of the Old Testament. He is this genocidal maniac that loves to just kill anyone who won't believe in him and even sends his people out to destroy the infidels. But here... Jonah, the prophet of God, says, I didn't want to go because I know how you are, God. I know that you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. God, you don't enjoy judging people, and I want you to. I want you to be angry at all the liberals. I want you to destroy the progressives. I want you to get rid of everything that I don't like, God. But no, you see, our God is, is slow to anger. Don't we enjoy it when God is slow to anger with us, yet we want him to be fast to anger with, with our enemies? 
We enjoy it when God is gracious and merciful to us, but we want him to be completely graceless and merciless to our enemies. We love it when God is abundant in loving kindness toward us, when he relents from doing us harm, but we want him to be relentless in dishing out his righteous indignation to our enemies. And even in that right there, that attitude of looking at the world as our enemies is indicative of a wrong position in your heart. They are not our enemies. They're simply lost. They're not someone that we should enjoy seeing destroyed. They're lost. They don't have Jesus. We do. We should be so excited to share with them at every opportunity. And we should praise and rejoice every single time one of them turns away from their sinfulness and comes back to Him. But this attitude is not new. It was written here in the Old Testament. It was seen even by some of Jesus' disciples. It was seen even a few hundred years ago when Jonathan Swift, the author who wrote Gulliver's Travels and many, many, many other things. He wrote many things in satire, and one of the things that he wrote to a church once, he said, we are God's chosen few. All others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you because we can't have heaven crammed. It seems, though, like some Christians have that attitude, like there's just not enough room in God's kingdom for other people to come into the kingdom as well. But if more billions of people come to know Jesus, am I ever going to get to be close to Jesus up in heaven? How far back am I going to have to sit? It would be better for me to die than to live. Lord, please take now my life from me. Lord, just kill me. I would rather die than see repentance come to the hearts of these people that I hate. Christian, if you have even the smallest part of that attitude in your heart tonight, you better get down on your hands and knees right now and cry out to God and beg Him to purge that from you. Whatever it is in your heart that is stopping you from fully being on mission for the gospel and the kingdom of Jesus Christ, you better get on your hands and knees right now and beg God to rip that out of you no matter how painful it might be because it will be better for you and the world in the long run. So then God does what he often does when we begin to have petty, wrong thoughts when we begin to accuse God of something that is not within his nature, when we get frustrated with him for not doing what he said he would do, it's often been said that statements accuse, but questions convict. Questions cause us to introspect. Questions cause us to, to think through, why do I think that? How did I come to that conclusion? Why do I hold to this position? Questions are good. It's why Jesus 
asked questions many, many times. That's why what's become known as the Socratic method. Socrates would not spoon-feed answers to his disciples. He would question and cause them to come to their own conclusions because when you come to that conclusion by being questioned, you're going to hold to it that much more strongly, which is a good thing. But even our most strongly held beliefs, we should allow those beliefs to be questioned. We should be okay with those things being questioned because we should have answers for why we hold the positions that we hold. So here God, just like he had done many more times, he asked in Genesis chapter 3, where are you? He asked in 1 Samuel 13 to Saul, what have you done? He asked in Isaiah chapter 6, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Jesus asked, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? And then in the next chapter in Matthew 7, he says, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? So here the Lord asks a simple question. Is it right for you to be angry? He could have come down in some imprecatory, thundering voice and said, Jonah, you have no right to be angry about that which I sent you to do. You have no right to be angry because this is who I am. But no, God graciously, mercifully, with an abundance of loving kindness, being slow to anger, he simply comes to Jonah and asks him, is it right for you to be angry? There are a lot of things right now going on in our society that could be questioned with that because there are many people that are angry about many things. Is it right for you to be angry? It's very easy for us to try to justify our anger as being some kind of righteous indignation. And there are times when it is appropriately righteous indignation. But how many times do we simply couch our own sinful desires within some kind of self-ascribed godliness or I am trying to protect God's glory and God's name? when really it's just about what you want. So Jonah, after being asked this question, doesn't even seem to answer it. We don't have anything recorded. He leaves the city. So in verse 5, he went out of the city and sat on the east side, and there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade that he might see what would become of the city. So he makes himself this little makeshift shelter outside of the city and just waits and watches. Because I think Jonah, this, this indicates where his heart still is in this. And he has seen the repentance. He has heard the proclamation come out from the king. Maybe he's thinking, though, this is going to be short-lived. Just, just a small little thing. They, they're not really going to stick with this. And so I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to sit, and I'm going to wait, and I'm going to watch. And then when God rains down the fire and brimstone from heaven, just like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm going to cheer, and I'm going to be able to go back home and say, yes, I am the prophet of God. I predicted. I tried to tell them about God, but when they rejected it, then God destroyed them. How awesome of a man am I? What he should have been doing, rather than sitting outside of the city, waiting and hoping that they would be destroyed, is he should have been going house to house, or he should have been having some kind of other meeting where he's saying, hey, you new followers of God, do you want to know what it means to worship God? Do you want to know what it means to sacrifice to God? Do you want to know how you can get closer to him? Come on down, let, let's study the Torah, let's study the scriptures, let's see what we can learn from other people who have lived in the past. Let's organize a pilgrimage so we can all go down to Jerusalem and you can see the temple and you can worship God there. But no, instead of trying to engage with this culture that was having this revival, 
he goes and he makes himself a little, a little bunker, a place where he could sit and wallow in his bitterness to block out the world, to block out engaging with these people that were trying to discover God. And he just wanted to sit there and, hmm, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to get to watch God's judgment rain down. Christians, you got to be careful about sitting at home or sitting in the church or going to some place that you are trying to block out the world and then sit there and watch the news and just say, okay, hopefully some more of those evil progressive people are going to get destroyed today. Hmm. Who's going to get God's axe? Hmm. Or cheering or being satisfied or being pleased when someone who claims to not have known God dies. If you believe that someone doesn't know God and they die, rather than be angry about it, rather than sit in a shelter and just wait and see what would become of them, rather than even maybe rejoicing a little bit that they're dead, it should grieve our souls that now they are forever going to be separated from God in hell. But even in the midst of all this, God begins to show Jonah even more grace. In verse 6, God prepares this plant to come over Jonah. God did a lot of preparation from Jonah. He, he told him what he wanted to do in chapter 1, then Jonah tried to run away, so he prepares this great fish. And now in this chapter, we're going to see three other things that God prepared for Jonah to try to continue to show him and teach him and guide him in the way that he wants to go. And I just think none of this had to happen if Jonah would have just stayed in the city and used that opportunity to be a blessing to others rather than be upset about the situation in which Jonah found himself, just take every opportunity. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do we as Christians believe that or not? Even when the governor released his newest thing saying that we're not supposed to meet inside of church buildings anymore, do we believe that that is another opportunity from God to be a blessing and a witness and another way that God is showing his love toward us? Do we still believe Romans 8.28 is in the Bible? Or has Governor Newsom been able to usurp God's authority to use all things for his good and for our good? So the Lord God prepares this plant, and he made it to come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So even as Jonah is sitting there wallowing in his misery, just bitter, angry, frustrated, hoping that people would die, God shows him grace. God gives him a little bit of grace, and this is the only time that we see now in the entire book of Jonah. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Wasn't grateful for the tens of thousands of people that just repented. But he was grateful for this little plant that gave him some shade and gave him some comfort. Gave him some relief from the heat of the day. Christian, how selfish are you going to be? How selfish are you going to be? If tens of thousands of people repenting of their sin doesn't make you grateful, yet God giving you something does, Wow. Your heart needs to change tonight. This kind of destructive behavior, I believe, gets me righteously indignant. Righteously 
uh, frustrated. Well, we have no desire to engage with the world, or we maybe begrudgingly do so after a lot of pushing from God. But then we sit back and pray, either literally or secretly in their hearts, through their attitude that those evil sinners would just die and go away. But hey, Jonah was getting what he wanted in that moment, so if they all died, eh, okay, that's fine. But as morning dawned, it says in verse 7, the next day, God had prepared a worm. So God prepared the plant, and now God has prepared a worm to teach Jonah a lesson. And it so damaged the plant that it withered. So God gave him a little bit of grace, gave him some relief, but then God takes that relief away. God takes that thing that Jonah had done nothing for and nothing about and takes it away. And then in verse 8, And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind. So God prepared the shade to give him some relief. Then God prepared the worm that took away the shade. And now God has prepared this east wind to make him very uncomfortable. It's often been said that a preacher's job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. God here is afflicting a comfortable one of his prophets. I wonder how bad the east wind was inside of the city. So if Jonah had just been there the whole time, he wouldn't have even known. If Jonah had been in someone's house teaching them about God, would he have even noticed that there was an east wind? Perhaps that's the thing when we stay on mission and when we're doing what God has called us to do and when we are fulfilling the purpose for which God created us and has called us to be Christians, then some of these uncomfortable things just aren't even noticed because I'm just too focused on what really matters. So the sun beats down on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. So second time now that he wished death for himself, and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah gets so exasperated with the whole situation now that once again he cries out to God and says, just kill me now. I would rather die than have to go and be with those people. It saddens me to say this, but I remember when I was a kid, I was, and I still am. I am. It, it's become acceptable now, though, in society to kind of be a nerd. When I was growing up in the late 80s and early 90s in elementary school. I got made fun of quite a bit. I had various interests and hobbies that were not a part of the cool stuff that cool kids should do. So I got made fun of constantly. It just it, it was a part of my daily life and daily experience. And there was one time that I remember being on the playground. I was probably 10, 11 years old. It's being teased just incessantly. And it got to the point where I was so frustrated. I was crying. And as I'm walking away crying, I turned around and I shouted as loud as I could. And I said, one day, though, one day I will have the last laugh because I'll be in heaven and you'll be burning in hell. I see that now as just like a completely immature response, and I think back and I, I realize that was such a terrible attitude, especially because of the fact that I thought that they were unsaved. And I thought that I would be laughing at the fact that, ha, huh, I'm in paradise, you're burning in hell. Because that worldly thought process of I will have the last laugh That had even crept into my young heart. And here Jonah is saying, I just I would I would rather die now than have to actually watch these people. His, his attitude is so disgusting. And 
And even though I read this, and even though I think back on my own heart, and I realize how I had a very immature response at that time in my life, I recognize that this is not a unique thought that people have. Jonah had that thought. I had that thought. Fifteen years of ministry experience has now taught me that there are many Christians that have a similar heart that they would rather just see the unsaved, unchristian world go away then try to reach them and engage them with the gospel. And that's sad. And it's not Christ-like behavior at all. So God simply asks him once again this very direct question. Is it right for you to be angry? And now he specifically says about the plant. And what a sad commentary that Jonah's last recorded words are dripping with bitterness. It is right for me to be angry even to death. Jonah felt that he had a right to be comfortable. Jonah felt he had a right to to this plant that God had made. Jonah felt he had a right to not be intermingling his life with people that he didn't like. People that were different from him. People that had a different upbringing than he did. Jonah felt like he had a right to be angry. He was justified in that. And God, I am even allowed to be angry at you and you should kill me rather than make me suffer. But once again, the Lord lovingly, graciously, yet directly tries to get Jonah to recognize the error of his thoughts and attitudes. You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Jonah, you have pity on a plant. You have pity on a piece of vegetation. Shouldn't I care about lives, souls? There is a problem when either figuratively or literally, we as Christians care more about facilities landscaping, plants, signs, everything else than the souls of the people that are all around us that don't know their right hand from their left. God says, you pity, you are pitying the wrong things, Jonah, my servant. The man who I've called. You're pitying the wrong things. These are people that they, they, they are so immature in their spiritual understanding, they don't even know they're right from their left. They need you, Jonah. They need you to direct them. They need you to teach them. That's why I sent them to you. Shouldn't I pity them because I created them in my image too? God says, I love them. And look at all the other livestock and all the other animals that I've created. Shouldn't I care about them? Shouldn't you? But well, Christian, I think it's time for us to do some, some soul searching tonight, some heart searching to see where our hearts are at. 
God wants Jonah to recognize there are a lot of people that don't know him that were, that were trying to engage with God. But this just made Jonah upset. The book ends very abruptly with this last question that we've already read now. Shouldn't I pity those people, Jonah? You pity a plant. You pity landscaping. I want to pity souls. I want to be out there reaching people. So do we really care about the lost? Do you really care about reaching people with the gospel? Or would you rather just have God wipe out all of the sinners so that you can have a quiet, pristine, and wonderful life once again? Are you willing to take up your cross and follow Jesus? Are you willing to go wherever He wants us to go? Are you willing to say whatever He wants you to say? Are you willing to do whatever He wants you to do? Are you willing to follow His leading? Are you willing to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Let's pray that God purges out the cancer of selfishness, bitterness, anger, frustration, the, the tribalism that makes us look at we are here and they are out there. All that needs to be removed tonight. Let's ask God to remove from our hearts. Lord, we come to you and we ask that you would purge us of any of the Jonah-like selfish attitudes. Lord, I thank you for this book of the Bible, this prophet of God who is an example, Lord, that you, your work is going to be done. People are going to come to know you as Savior. But you want us to have these opportunities to tell them about Jesus. To lead them to you. To show them the benefit of living a, a Christ-filled, Spirit-filled life. So God, change our priorities. Convict our hearts. Purge out anything that is leading us away from you. And Lord, let us lift up and proclaim widely, loudly, profoundly, boldly, Lord, the name of Jesus in these uncertain and trying times. Thank you for every opportunity that we have to share the gospel with someone else. Lord, please be with us tonight. Be magnified in our lives in Jesus' wonderful name.